All right. Um, so I won't go over this in too much detail, um, but we learned a lot of really useful stuff for data cleaning, especially how to deal with NAs, how to do case when and recode and things like that. Um, super, super useful. Uh, I don't think anyone has had perfectly clean data going into an analysis. So hopefully that will be useful for all of you. Okay, more here. Um, and then just as a reminder, there's cheat sheets for all the material we're covering. Uh, there may even be extra functions on there that might be specific or, or more useful to you in particular. Uh, so definitely check those out. Okay, so this specific uh, module, we're going to talk about how to manipulate data. So in other words, we're going to talk about reshaping data from wide format to long format. And maybe that doesn't mean anything quite yet, but we'll get into that. We'll talk also about reshaping from long to wide, so going back and forth between those formats. And we'll also talk about combining data, so how you would merge data or perform joins. OK, uh, so first thing first, what is wide versus long data? So I want you to keep this in mind is that the data is not different. Data is wide or long with respect to certain variables. OK, so in this uh, kind of picture example I've got here, in the first one uh, on the left, I've got the wide format. So I have uh, maybe each line is a different patient ID. And each column is some day I'm making a measurement. Um, and so those values are A, B, C, D, E, F for those different patients. However, um, you know, this is not necessarily the best format for everything. And so there are cases where I might want it in long format, especially if I'm going to do some analysis in R or maybe do some visualizations. So the long format on the right hand side, I've taken those columns that are labeled day one, day two, and day three. And those are actually values in a column called day now. And then value is all of those letter metrics that I've been measuring. OK, so uh, I can see just looking at this that the data is not actually different, but the data is in a slightly different format. OK, so how would this look with um, some of the uh, values I actually um, have and, and could print to my R console. Uh, so again, data stored differently in the tibble. And wide data has many columns. So let's imagine I'm looking at the vaccine rate and uh, I'm looking at the state of Alabama. And then my different columns are different months of the year. Um, and so I've got June and it seems to be going back in time. Okay. Um, but the values themselves are, are uh, same order of magnitude. I can tell we're kind of measuring the same thing, but maybe over time um, or in some other context. And long, those column names become the data. So those column names here, uh, June, May, April, those are now uh, values in this column called name. OK? And uh, here's like a great opportunity to think about that separate function. So maybe the only the month is actually important to me uh, in this suffix. The vax rate is not actually helpful anymore. OK, um, and so wide data typically has multiple columns per individual or per some unit of ID. In our case, maybe we're looking at states with values spread across multiple columns. So I have one line for Alabama, and then I have all those values that I'm measuring across different columns. And then a, one line for Alaska, and then again, all those values I'm measuring. However, for the long data, I have multiple rows per observation. So multiple rows for Alabama, do, 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 going down, and then multiple rows for Alaska uh, with a single column that contains those values with another column that uh, called name in this case that's describing the month or some attribute of that value being reported. OK, so sometimes it just helps to see it in visual format. So let's take a moment and check out the data moving from long to wide 
and back again. So here we've got wide, we've got keys and IDs and values, and they're being pivoted into a long format. Okay, very cool. <laughs> so uh, why do we need to actually think about switching between wide and long data if the data is the same? Uh, so in general, wide data is uh, a bit easier for humans to read, right? Maybe it makes a little bit more sense to us and we can kind of clip two columns, especially if we're working in something like Excel. Uh, you know, that's sort of typically what is done and what's more readable. However, Long format is going to be easier for R to make plots, do analysis, do summarization, um, and do grouping. Uh, so there's a lot of things that long format is going to be necessary for, for R. And it's also generally a little bit cleaner um, and tends to be better practice for storing data. OK. so. Let's say uh, we want to actually do this in practice and play around with pivoting our data in R. Um, and so we could pivot our data using the tidy R package, which is part of the tidyverse. Uh, the tidy, uh, tidy R allows you to do that data tidying uh, with these functions called pivot longer, which makes multiple columns into variables. So taking values that are uh, originally column names and scrunching them down into another variable, um, as well as going to the opposite, taking the data from long format to wide format using the pivot wider function. Uh, so again, taking uh, variables and actually spreading them out into columns uh, for wide format. And because it's really handy uh, with these two functions, the pivot longer, pivot wider, uh, we'll review a little bit of separate just because it's it's uh, going to help us out here. I do want to point out really quick, there is a command or function called reshape. Um, it is really confusing to use, uh, so we don't recommend using it. You can, um, but you might, and you might see, um, you know, Stack Overflow posts online that refer to reshape, um, but we don't consider it super intuitive, so I don't recommend it. Um, and you might see old functions called gather, which is going to be an equivalent of pivot longer, and spread, which is an equivalent of pivot wider. These are basically old names for the pivot longer and pivot wider function. They work a little bit differently, um, but you might see these when Googling around. They work very similarly. All right, so let's talk a little bit about pivot longer. Pivot longer is going to put column data into rows. Uh, so we're first going to describe which columns we want to pivot longer. Uh, so we'll take uh, some wide data. So this is generally like the format we're going to see is starting out with some wide data. And we'll pipe that into the pivot longer function. And we have to tell it, OK, well, what columns do you want to make into long format? Uh, and we provide those using the calls function. And we'll uh, combine using the combine function and tell it which columns we actually want to pivot. And then, of course, we'll want to reassign that to some other object name. All right. Um, so let's say we have some. Uh, wide data. And uh, let me actually get this up and running on my R Studio. Give me just one second. Okay. Um, and I'm going to get rid of some of this here. And just open up another chunk. All right. Awesome. Um, so let's say I have some wide data. I'm going to go ahead and run this and clean up my console a bit and preview this wide data. OK, it's like the world's smallest data set here. OK, um, but we want to pivot that 
to a longer format. So we want a column describing those values uh, that are the, currently the column names and some values for, you know, maybe this is the vaccine rate we were talking about. Uh, so taking the wide data and piping that into pivot longer. And then we have to tell it what columns we actually want to pivot. Um, and so we can just tell it, you know, I want you to pivot everything. Awesome. I don't even have to write those columns out. I could if I wanted to, uh, but here we go. Um, I tell it the columns I want to pivot. And then I end up with these two new column names called name and called value. And of course, I could reassign this if I wanted to. OK, so that was the kind of tip of the iceberg. But uh, we describe the columns we want to pivot. But maybe we want to actually give those columns new names. Um, so the names to argument is going to give a new name to the pivoted columns. And then the values to um, argument is going to give a new name to the values to be used in those columns. So how does, how does this work in practice? So let's go ahead and save this as our long data. And let's say, uh, actually, I want to do um, the names to and values to. So I'll break line to kind of keep things clean here. So let's say, uh, instead of name, let's make names to equal to something like month. Um, and maybe we could eventually take out that vax rate suffix on those on those values. Um, so let's see what that looks like. All right, so a uh, better column name here. That looks good. Uh, but let's do the values too as well. And let's say uh, I want that to be uh, rate. And run that. Excellent. So I can actually specify those values because uh, name and value aren't very descriptive. Um, I could even be um, really specific and say vaccination rate, uh, month of the year, whatever I want. Uh, note that because I created a space here, it's got to be in back ticks. All right, and uh, general format is right here. So of course, feel free to copy that down whenever you're working on Pivot Longer. OK, again, an example here. Um, the names to is month, and the values to is rate. And then we end up with those column names uh, newly imputed in our long data. And uh, I know we sometimes get question about like, oh, well, when do column names need to be in quotation marks? Uh, we do need those column names in quotation marks for pivot longer. OK, so uh, let's get a little bit of practice using the Charm City Circulator data. And remember, this is the, uh, the different bus routes. Um, I've got days of the week, uh, date of the year, and then different uh, different uh, bus lines in Baltimore. We've got the orange line, the purple line, and we've got boardings, a lighting, so getting on and off, and then an average value of those. But uh, we can see that there's a lot of columns here, right? So much so that they're getting cropped off of this preview. Okay, um, so let's go ahead and uh, read this into R so we can play with it a little bit. So what did we call this? We said this was circ read circulator. And of course, we need to load the JHUR package before we can do this. Read it in. And let's take a look. OK, days of the week, date of the year, and a bunch of different boarding numbers. And I can see I've got some missing data. So not the most clean data set.
All right. Okay, so uh, let's say we want to uh, create some kind of summary table from this data. We want to create a table of average ridership by route and line. Results should look something like, okay, we've, we've seen some of these when we've done the count tables, right? Um, but we want to create a table which has each line here um, and an average ridership, okay? Um, so this is going to be a little tricky, right? Because we have all of these different columns, right? Orange is actually spread out, right? Across three different columns. Um, and so is purple, so is green um, and banner. Okay, so this is going to be a little tricky. Okay, so uh, let's actually play around with reshaping this data. Um, so we'll take the circ data set, we'll take that and pipe it into the pivot longer function. You can take it, the data set, just directly into pivot longer. But the first thing we have to give pivot longer is which columns we're actually pivoting, right? So let's see if we can uh, break this a little bit. So taking circ and taking it into pivot longer, what if we did calls uh, was everything like we did before? Is this going to work? Okay. Um, so it can't really do that if we've got columns of different types, right? We've got numbers, we've got that date column, we've got uh, values, uh, numeric values from different, uh, those different lines, and we've got days of the week, right? So this is, this is not going to work. Um, so let's go ahead and use our um, tidy select commands. And we talked a little bit about this when we were talking about subsetting data is how, we, how you select columns. And so let's say we want to take everything that starts with, and we've got a preview of that here. So we could do starts with, ends with, contains, matches. There's lots of options. So let's say we want to do columns that start with uh, the, I think we had purple, we had green, we had orange and we had um, banner, which is not a color and is kind of confusing, but we'll go with it. Yeah, good question. So let's let's do that. Let's see what happens. Okay. Um, so it's it's seeing, okay, there's an unused argument, right? It's thinking that these are arguments to a function, right? And that's not really the way it starts with works. It's expecting one argument as the series of things that it's starting with. And so we're providing it a vector here and not providing it multiple arguments. So you, we're using the combined function to basically package those all up into one vector that we're providing the starts with function. Okay, um, but if we were doing something like select, we wouldn't have to do that because it sort of knows that it expects uh, multiple values and multiple arguments to be the different columns that you want. Okay, um, all right, so let's see what this looks like. Okay, um, so remember that name and value column that I got before, the really nondescript column names? Um, I can see that uh, day, date, and daily have not been touched, but these columns that were purple boardings, purple A lightings, green boardings, all of those, they got scrunched into this name column, and their values got scrunched into this value column. Okay, so uh, we have a lot more rows now, right? So we have like 13,000 rows versus the 1,000 rows that we had before. So much longer, fewer columns. Okay, uh, so let's call that long. And we can kind of package that up, take a look. Awesome. Okay, um, and so when we're taking a look at this data, those unpivoted, you know, the columns that we didn't specify using green, purple, 
banner, all that, the unpivoted columns appear the same as they did before. So if we were to look at circ, I have the day, date, and this column all the way to the right daily, and I still have those columns. They are unchanged um, in, uh, in the long data set. OK? So we're not messing with those columns. OK, so let's put some of our cleaning into practice. Uh, so let's use string replace from the string R package to put spaces in the names, right? Because purple A lighting's like, uh, let's not do the camel case here. Let's create a space uh, from which we can actually do some, some separating. OK, uh, so let's go ahead and use string replace for this. All right, so we've got long. We're going to pipe that in to mutate. OK, and we want that name column to be uh, piped into the string replace function. So remember, uh, we're following that string replace, what we're replacing, the old pattern, and then the new pattern. And let me break down here. OK, got everything going. OK, so string replace. We're going to take name, and we're going to replace uh, let's see, board with underscore board. OK, so what is this actually going to look like if we were to run just this part? So I can see really quick just that uh, the first value here, it didn't have that underscore, uh, but now it does have that underscore. OK, uh, so let's do just a little bit more cleanup. We'll take a uh, name, we'll do string replace on it so that average is now underscore average and taking name once more and doing a light and replacing it with underscore a light. And let's double check that to make sure that looks OK. Yep, looks great. And we'll reassign that. All right. So we've gone from having uh, these kind of camel caps terms in the name column to having underscores. That looks a little bit cleaner, but it's also going to aid us in the next step where we want to separate the name of the route from whether it's a, a boarding type or a lighting type. OK, uh, so uh, when we use separate, and we already have talked about this a bit, but it's such a handy function, it's uh, great to review it. Um, so the first argument should be which column we're actually going to split up. So we're going to take that data set, we're going to pipe it into separate, and then we're going to take the name column because that's the one we've been working on. OK. So we're going to take long, we're going to pipe it into separate, and we're going to say, all right, what column? Uh, I want to separate the name column. And uh, we got to tell it what we want to se actually separate it into. So we want to separate this column into new columns named line and type. And so this is actually where that, um, that combined function is super, super important. So let's say we weren't doing the combined function and said, OK, it's line and type. Notice how it it's going to see this and think it's an additional argument to separate. Uh, but we're not actually declaring it. We don't know what that argument's name is. It's not going to uh, interpret this correctly. 
So very, very important that we use the combined function here. And then follow that with what the separating character is. So remember, we want to separate by something. And in this case, let's separate it on the underscore. And close those parentheses. So always fun when we do this and end up like, where is the, uh, why am I not getting output? Go ahead and close it up, run it. And uh, I can see now that I've split it into two different columns. Fantastic. So now I could potentially do some grouping by those different uh, types of on and off of the bus, those different measurements. Or I could do summaries by the different lines of, of the buses. All right, finally, let's go back to our mission. Our data was uh, is now more tidy. And we can actually do those averages uh, and do that summarizing a lot more easily. So let's say I actually reassign this. And uh, remember, our mission was to take uh, those different lines and try to figure out what some kind of average was per line. So let's head back to deep in the memory palace to try and figure out uh, the, the right functions here for summarizing. Uh, so let's go ahead first and group by. And what do we want to group on? We want to group on line. So let's group by line. And remember that group by doesn't change the data, right? It just says that there's groups. But then when combined with summarize, we have a lot of power at our fingertips. Uh, so summarize, let's say the average is a mean of this value column. Okay. Um, so there are NAs, so we should see something a little angry if we run this. We see lots of NAs uh, because by default, R doesn't know what to do with them unless we tell it to exclude them. So let's do NA.RM equals true. All right. Uh, so that we have this summary that we wanted to create. Uh, we did have to do a little massaging of the data, right? Changing the shape of it so that we could do uh, this averaging. But we were able to accomplish that pretty well. OK, uh, just as I mentioned before, when we're selecting the columns, there's lots of ways we can get what we want, right? Contain, starts with, ends with. Remember that we can also use this exclamation point to say what we don't want to pivot, right? Uh, or don't want to select. So. If I were to pivot and say, I don't want to pivot day, date, and daily, I could get the exact same results. So there's lots of ways. Just keep in mind that there's lots of ways to select the columns that you want to do pivot longer on. Um, and this is a really nice resource for that. So I encourage you to check that out. Um, you can look in the documentation, but I do like this one because it has some nice examples. All right. Um, so pivot wider. Let's go the other way. Okay, so pivot wider is going to spread that row, that long data into columns. It's a little easier to look at maybe. Um, and uh, maybe it's, it's just a kind of the output format we'd prefer. Uh, so pivot wider is going to take two key arguments. It's going to take a names from argument, and it's going to take a values from argument. OK, um, and so the names from is the old column whose contents will be spread into column names, you know, the, the names of those columns. And then the values from is going to be the column whose contents will fill in uh, those, those new values inside those new columns. OK. Uh, so pivot wider, and then again, these two arguments. All right, um, so our long data, going back to our uh, vaccine uh, rate example, go all the way up here. 
and run this one more time. So I've got long data that looks like this. If I wanted to take that and spread it out, um, I do need to tell it uh, the names from and the values from. So pivot longer can sometimes guess if you give, uh, give it the columns, it could say, oh, you want to call it name and value. Not great, again, not great column names, but uh, it can give you something. But pivot wider is going to need a little bit more information. So we've got long data, and we want to pipe that into pivot wider. And we got to say, all right, well, I want those names from to be that month column. And I want the values from to be the vaccination rate column. All right, so things are spread out. Uh, they're back kind of where we started. Um, it should look pretty uh, unusual if you were to, for example, uh, mix up the names and the values. So let's say we did names from and we said, all right, this should be vaccination rate. And let me actually give it the correct column name. And then values from is month. So this, this doesn't really look like useful data, right? Um, so again, check your data every step of the way. Um, if you see something that looks like this, where there's numbers in the column names and then uh, text in the cells themselves, maybe uh, you've got some of those backwards. This would be a little, a little silly if we had that. Okay, um, so once again, we have this long data that we were cleaning up before. And so let's uh, say we wanted to pivot it so that we had boardings, A lightings, and average into their own columns. So once again, looking at the long data set here, we could take the data set long and pipe that into pivot wider. And again, we just have these two arguments. Let's say uh, we want names from to be, Okay, again, what are the, what are our column names going to be? I want the columns to be boardings, a lightings, and average. So we're going to refer to the type column for that. And then what do I want those values to be? I want them to come from the value column. All right. Um, so I can see that that column that was type is now they now have each their own column, OK? And so I could do this really any number of ways. So let's say I was more interested in breaking it down by day of the week. I could take long and pivot wider and say, all right, well, I want my names from to be day, and I want the uh, values from to be the same. I want it to be the ridership. All right. So uh, again, lots of NAs in our data set, but now I have uh, it broken down by day of the week for um, all the different routes uh, and types here. Um, yeah, so maybe if I was just interested in um, averaging across Sundays or something like that. I could I could do that. Okay, so to summarize, pivoting longer and wider, uh, these functions come from the tidier package. We've been using the dplyr package quite a bit. These are a little different, so. Um, you might be surprised if, oh, you know, we don't have the right packages loaded. Thankfully, the tidyverse packages both up. So uh, just refer to that and load the tidyverse. You should be good to go on pivoting and, and doing this manipulation. Remember, the pivot longer goes from wide to long format. And you want to specify the columns you want to pivot. 
uh, specify the names to and the values to arguments for custom naming. Otherwise, you're going to end up with name and value. Again, not super explanatory, but it's okay for an intermediate um, object if you need it. Uh, and then finally, pivot wider goes from long format to wide format. And you do need to specify where the names of the new columns are coming from with the names from argument, and then what those values to fill the cells are going to be. So that comes from the values from argument. Okay, let's jump back into it. All right, so we talked a little bit about pivoting and kind of reshaping our data in uh, various ways. So now let's talk about growing our data, combining it. Uh, so we'll talk about joining our data sets, which was probably pretty familiar to you if you've worked in a, in a language like SQL or worked on a lot of databases. Um, and I, I apologize, the bottom of this image got cropped off, but uh, I think the Venn diagrams are a really nice way to look at this. Um, so here I've got a left join. Um, and we'll talk more about what these terms mean in a second, if they're unfamiliar to you. If not, great. Uh, we've got right join up here. Uh, the bottom, we have an inner join. And the bottom, we have bottom right, we have a full join. And so this represents various ways of combining two data sets. So what do we do when the data is not perfectly aligned between our data sets? How do we decide what data to keep and what data to discard? Okay, so uh, merging and joining data sets in the tidyverse approach in R is typically done with the dplyr package. Uh, so we're returning to that package that literally does so much stuff for us. Um, and so we're going to join together data sets, uh, which are usually based on key variables such as an ID or um, uh, just some sort of identification number or key. Um, you can look at the question mark join to see different types of joining in R. So uh, I can learn a little bit more about inner join, full join, uh, right join, all this stuff. So there's more documentation here if you want to refer back to it. Um, but let's kind of recap what some of these functions are going to look like and what they actually do. So let's imagine we have a data set X and a data set Y. Uh, so these are two tibbles or two data frames that we've got floating around in our R environment. Uh, so an inner join, when we combine those two data sets, only rows that match for both X and Y are kept. Okay, so if there's no match, if there's some that don't match or don't line up quite perfectly, get rid of them. A full join means we're going to keep all of the rows of both state data sets, don't get rid of anything, keep everything, even if they only overlap by a little bit, don't discard any data. We wanna to be totally cautious here. Uh, a left join means we'll keep all the rows of X, uh, even if they're not merged with Y, but only the matches with Y are kept. And a right join um, is sort of the opposite end of that. We keep everything from Y, but only the matches of X. So everything on the right-hand side is kept um, and literally on the right side of this equation, right? Um, and then on the left join, everything on the left-hand side of this, uh, of this equation is kept. And then um, anti-join is a little uh, funky and you may find cases where it's useful for you, um, but it's all rows from X that are not in Y, just keeping those data from X. So maybe you're interested in like, okay, well, what data am I missing from Y? Uh, Anti-join could be helpful for that. Um, but that's usually more for data checking and quality and things like that, rather than actually combining your data. Uh, but you may find that useful. Okay. Um, so let's play around with some simple examples. We've got uh, data A. So, so this is uh, our states with start, that start with the letter A, and we've got some vaccination rate. Um, 
and then we've got data cold, which is states that are cold. So maybe Maine and Alaska, but Alabama is not so cold. So that's not in that data set. Um, and so I've got this loaded up already. I'm just going to run this to load them up in my memory. And I'll go ahead and stick this in the chat if you want to follow along. Okay, um, so again, if I want to take a look, data A's and data cold. All right, um, so my data sets are different, but you know, maybe I want to combine them, right? I want a full set, a full picture of what the vaccination rates are. All right, again, visualization, really, really handy. Uh, so this is sort of a GIF showing what inner join looks like between a data set X on the left and a data set Y on the right. So even though they have their own distinct data, I don't care about it. Let's just get rid of it and keep only those matches that we have in between the two. All right, so what does it look like if we do inner join on our data A's and data cold? So let's do inner join. And literally, we can just take those data sets and separate them by a comma. Pretty straightforward. All right, so let's take a look at that. Um, I get this message that it's joining with by um, equals join by state. OK, so that's in interesting. We're going to want to keep that in our uh, mind for later. Um, but I'm only left with Alaska, right? Because this was the only state that was in both data sets. OK, but now I have three columns. Yay, I combined data that I maybe wanted to have all next to each other. OK, and here I'm assigning it to uh, I'm an, an object called IJ for inner join, um, and I can preview it that way. But interesting that it gives me this message. So even if I go ahead and assign this to an object, it gives me that message. It's important information to know about. But again, we'll cover that in just a second. All right, uh, our left join. So keeping everything in X on the left-hand side of the data, um, but discarding any unique stuff from Y. So let's see how that is going to look for us. So let's call this left join, uh, and we'll use the left. Hopefully everyone can see this OK. Use the left join function. We'll do data A's and data cold. And then take a look at left join. All right. And uh, notice that I've introduced an NA here because I didn't really have that data um, on on that side of the uh, on that side of the join. Uh, so anything that's not you know does not have a match there um, is going to be populated with an NA. All right, uh, so pretty straightforward. Once again, we get an NA where uh, there was not a, a matching equivalent on the other data set. All right, so uh, the tidy log package, which we have to install if we don't have it already installed, uh, is really nice for showing us kind of a report or a little bit of more in insight into what's happening in the join. We can all be very nervous about dropping data, totally normal. Um, and so maybe we want a little bit more information when we are doing our joins. So let me go ahead and do the same thing, but I'm going to load up the tidy log package. So let me do that up here, actually. Um, so I'll do library tidy log, and I already have it installed, so I can just click that and load it. Okay, you should get some messaging, um, and it does does quite a bit of, of uh, masking. So just uh, be aware that it's it's going to kind of change the way some of those functions work and in, in that they give more 
it gives more information about what's happening that can sometimes be too much information. <laughs> uh, so it does give you a lot of, uh, of output. Um, so let's run this first uh, inner join here. OK, um, it says I'm joining by the state column. And uh, I have some rows that are only an X. I have one row that's only an X that I'm actually, the parentheses noting that I'm actually not keeping it. Rows only in Y, again, one that I'm not keeping. And then matched rows, I have one for a total of one row for IJ. Okay. And then for left join, let's run that one more time. Um, so there, again, it's giving me lots of information. It's saying that I do have one row that's only an X and I am keeping it. It's not in parentheses here. Um, but I do have one row only in Y that I'm just going to discard. Okay. Uh, I have one matched row and that gives me a total of two rows. So taking a look at that left join. Um, and so here we go. Uh, I have the row that was only an X right here. That data A is data, data set, um, but there's no value here. And then the one row that had a match for both data sets. Okay, so yeah, just giving me a, a lot of information. So let's talk about right join for a second. So this is very similar to the left join, but it's keeping everything on the right hand side and getting rid of anything unique on the left. So let's kind of see that in practice. So we've got right join and we'll give it the right join command or function and we'll tell it data A's and data cold. And again, we get all of this output. There's a row only an X that we're actually getting rid of. And what does this look like? All right. Yes, yeah. So. Uh, when we do the left join, it's keeping everything from what's on the left of the comma. And we're doing the right join, we're keeping everything that's on the right of the comma. All right. Um, so you may be, if you're really savvy, you might be thinking, well, hey, these are basically the same thing. What if I just switch where the data sets are, right? Um, why would I need a function called right join if I could just do left join and say, ah, okay, let's do data cold on this side and data A's on this side, right? And you'd be right. They are almost the same thing, uh, but I wanna show you just minor difference here. Um, the column order is a little bit different. Okay, so um, right join, and left join here, this one versus this one. I've got the same data, but just notice that the columns are in slightly different order. So here I've got June, May, April, and here I've got April, June, May. Okay, so if the order is important to you, maybe you'd want to choose to be more choosy about which uh, join you use, but the data will be the same. Okay, so again, switching arguments uh, gives us the same data, but the order is different. All right, full join. Let's keep everything. I don't want to get rid of any data. I want to keep everything, even if there's lots of NAs in the resulting data set. Okay, so how do we do all of that? Uh, let's take a look at that in practice. So let's say a uh, full join of data A's and data cold. And remember, I have, uh, when I looked at these data sets by themselves, let's scroll all the way up and take a look. 
I've got two lines of data for, for data cold and two lines for data A's. Okay, so it should be uh, quite a, a bit more or a bit more data that we have been seeing in the other joins. All right. Um, so in this case, uh, I had Alabama on the left hand side, but I didn't have a match with that right hand side data. Alaska has all of the data um, and then Maine only has a match on the right hand data set, the data cold data set. Okay. And uh, going up and checking out this tidy log, I can see that I've kept rows that are only in X. I kept a row that was only in Y, and then I kept a matched row for a total of three rows. Okay. Okay, uh, so we're going to uh, talk briefly about this includes duplicates uh, messaging that you might get. Um, so this is important to pay attention to, but not as, as much of an emergency as you might think. Okay. Um, so I'm going to work with a little bit more data here, and I'm going to once again drop this into the chat. I know that looks pretty gnarly, um, but we'll go ahead and bring that into R. Okay, um, and run this. So uh, I have data. A's is now Alabama and Alaska, and it's got this state bird, uh, very important information. And I have data cold, which is state, vax rate, and month. And maybe I did a nice pivot here, right? So similar data, um, but now states are uh, multiple lines per state, depending on what vaccine month we were talking about, OK? So uh, what is this includes duplicates that we're talking about here? Um, so again, these are the two data sets we're working with. Um, and let's, let's talk about this. So uh, here I've got some output from tidylog that says something called includes duplicates. So let's, let's see this. So let's do left join and we'll do data A's and data cold. OK, uh, so we get this result that says includes duplicates. And so what does this what does this mean is actually happening? So uh, on the left hand side, right, we had this data set that had only one line per state and it had the state bird. But in the data cold data set, we have multiple lines per state. OK, and so when we joined the data, we actually duplicated some of the data, OK? And so maybe this isn't a bad thing. Maybe for every single vaccination month, we also want to be able to refer to the state bird. You know, maybe we're really interested in giving vaccine recipients this information, OK? Um, but if I wanted to tally up how many instances of the state bird I had, maybe this, ac this information is not accurate, right? Um, I, I wouldn't want to overrepresent this this particular bird in the data set. Okay, so important to to be aware of. It's not necessarily an emergency, but it might change the way you summarize your data. So I think this could be a nice feature of um, of uh, the tidy log here. Okay, so once again, it's duplicated some of this data from the first data set to effectively join with the other data set, but maybe that's not something that we want to, to be present in our final data. Okay, just something to keep in mind. Okay, uh, yeah, so once again, Alaska and Willow Ptarmigan has appeared twice. Okay, so this is just a, a nice way to visualize that. OK, so even though the Y data is different, the X data is duplicated and it is the same. OK, so tidy log is pretty verbose. You know, we don't want always want uh, tons and tons of information. Uh, so you can easily stop tidy log with this 
function here, unload namespace, and then give it the tidy log package. So I'll go ahead and do that. I'm just going to unload it. And so this is basically the opposite of doing library and then the data set name, or sorry, the library and then the package name. Uh, this undoes that. OK, so now uh, when I do my joins, I should not get all that output. Uh, as sort of a note, this is opposite of library tidy log. Yeah, you don't need to reinstall it. OK. Um, yeah, so that stops tidy log. OK, so this is definitely something that we run into. Um, we might need to specify what we are actually joining on because our data sets might have different IDs. You know, maybe it's entity on the one data set and maybe it's state on the other data set. Um, so let's kind of see that argument in action. And uh, let's say we were doing our left join data A's and data cold. And I want to see if I spelled it right, that would be great. Um, and then I could say, all right, well, I want to tell you exactly what to join on. Uh, I can tell it by state. Okay. And so you notice now I don't get that message about joining uh, by state. Okay. So this is just an FYI, but if you declare it straight up, it doesn't feel the need to report that information to you. Okay. But, you know, let's say we have a more complicated situation where we have different ID uh, column names in those two data sets. OK, um, so if I have uh, basically multiple columns that I want to join on, um, I can also specify a vector of column names. So let's say I, I wanted to not only join on state, but I wanted to join on um, city or something as well. Um, so I could specify that with the by argument using uh, a vector and the combine function. Um, and uh, so something like this, so like I am joining on state and I am joining, let's imagine I had a column called city. I can do that. Um, but if I have columns from the two data sets with different names, I want to actually specify uh, the names that I'm using. So. Let's say that data A's was called state and data cold was called entity. And I can even change that here. So let's say this is called entity. And I will rerun this. And again, data cold is now entity and not state. If I try to join these, what's going to happen? OK, so it says, uh, you know, we don't really have uh, a way to join these two data sets, right? I don't know what to join on. Uh, so in that case, let's actually give it uh, some specifics here. And so uh, this is a little funky, the way that this is denoted, but we have to enclose this in uh, the combine function. So provide that combined function. And then I want to give it the name of the ID column on the left, and then the name of the ID column on the right. So that order is important. Uh, so on the left, I had the state column. And then I want to use an equal sign. And then the name on the right hand data set. OK, so let's try this again. All right, so uh, it's gone ahead and joined it uh, where state equals entity, and it's taken the first data sets um, argument as the, the final ID. OK, so 
Okay. Um, so we might want to determine what indexes are actually in that first data set that aren't in the sec in the second. You know, what's missing from uh, our data. And so we can use the set div function for that. Um, so let's kind of see that in in action. Um, we'll want to use the pull function for for the set diff stuff going forward. Okay, so giving myself a little space. Um, so again, I have the data A's and I have the data cold. Okay, and so let's take uh, these data sets and pull out the entities. So we'll pull out state for data A's and we'll pull out entity for data cold. Okay, uh, so now I have vectors of the different IDs in these data sets. Okay, and so once those are uh, saved as objects, I can really pretty easily do the set difference or basically what's missing from one versus the other. Uh, so let's go ahead and save these as objects. That's a good question. I'm not I'm not sure off the top of my head other than uh, consulting the documentation and have it. Um, Carrie, Cliff, Rupshika, I'm not sure if there's a, a kind of good practice you have for whether you need to pull some content or not. Um, yeah, I mean, so part of this is when we often when we are doing base R functions, we're going to need a vector. And so you'll have to pull the data. But generally speaking, yeah, there's not like a good guide per se. Like for stringer functions, you're going to need vectors, but it's not always necessarily obvious. So maybe we can make a resource about that. OK, so um, in the kind of the base sense of set diff, we've got uh, two different vectors. We've got ace. Uh, I got I to gotta run this, right? <laughs> that would help. Uh, I've got A states and I've got cold states. Okay. And so let's say uh, I wanted to find the basically what's what's non overlapping of these of these vectors. So let's say I'm doing set diff of A states versus cold states. Um, I can see that the values that are in A, but not in cold states, are Alabama. And likewise, if I were to do set diff of cold states and A states, I should get the value that's not in cold states, or not in A states, sorry. So the value in cold states that is not in A states. So that can be useful for figuring out you know, what, what are those values exactly that are not uh, having a match when you're doing the joining? Okay, um, so to summarize, we did merging and joining. The by argument can be really handy for when those indexes don't exactly match, right? You have something called state in one data set and something called region or something like that in the other data set and you want to make sure they can still be combined. Um, in practice, it's nice to call them the same thing, but that's not always the case. Um, and you can also use by to specify joining on multiple columns, right? So it's not just one column all the time. Maybe you want to join on multiple columns, um, you know, by year, by state, by um, treatment, something like that. Um, You've got inner join, which only keeps rows that match for both. We've got full join, which keeps all rows of both data sets. You've got left join, which keeps all rows of the left-hand data set, but not the Y data set. And then opposite of that, you've got the right join, which keeps all rows of Y, even if they're not matched with X. And the tidy log can be uh, really handy for giving us a detailed summary. 
uh, while set diff can be useful for showing us what is what in X might be missing from Y, right? So when you do that left join, what's actually happening? <laughs> 